For 50 years, Lego trains have used magnets to join the wagons together. They're pretty strong, which is useful, but it makes uncoupling wagons really difficult. There aren't really any tools to help this either. You can't just chop the wagons, because that's just not going to work. You can try and prise them apart, but you don't always know where the wagons will end up. And using more forceful methods... Not recommended. This is a Lego decoupler. This little flap lifts up and blocks one of the wagons when it's pushed from underneath. If we flip it over, you can see that this slope brick helps push the flap up, and it all hinges around this Technic axle. You can also see that it's pretty loose, so that it can rise and fall with very little strength required. The track piece is also raised by one stud height, so that we can get a slider underneath. And this is the slider mechanism. It's just two tiles upside down with a plate on one end and a bracket on the other. When we slide it under the track, it lifts up the flap. Now the reason I've used a bracket here is that it gives studs on two sides. This is a basic Lego technique called a snot, or studs not on top. And if we use another small bracket, we can mount a Technic rack to the top and still have the tiles upside down underneath. From there, we can start thinking about motors. Motors! And gears! And bricks! Here's how our slider fits into all of that. There's an identical one of these under this track. And it's driven by these Technic gears. Which go to this motor. These motors were available in Technic kicks in the 1990s, and they're 9 volt, just like the trains I'm using. These motors are very fast, but they're not very powerful at all, which also means they're really, really cheap. Now here's how the whole contraption works. Your wagons roll back past the flap. When the flap is between two wagons, the slider pushes in and raises the flap just enough to block the train wheels from underneath. If you then give your locomotive enough power in the opposite direction, it'll break away and uncouple your wagon. But how do we know when the wagon's in the right place? Now we can fit a trackside sensor here that detects the wagons and the gaps between them. In the previous tutorial, I made some infrared sensors, and this is exactly what I made them for. I'm mounting them at just the right height to measure the base plate of the wagon, and when the wagon's first detected and then not detected, the sensor recognizes the gap and sends that signal to our Arduino. If I just put a sensor on the other side of the track, you can see that this system actually drives two decouplers. When one's raised, the other one is lowered. That's perfect for working with sidings. So here's the task. We send the train around the track, then we reverse it into one siding, decouple the wagon, then collect the other wagon from the other siding. And we'll repeat that over and over, switching wagons after every full loop. Now here's the code that's going to get that running. I've tried to keep this simple, but we've got three motors and five sensors. Five. Yeah, deal with it. Two for the couplers, one for the track loop, and two ultrasonic sensors from tutorial four. I'll get to those in a minute. We've also got some variables to hold and compare those sensor values. Ta-da! State machine time. If you've not watched the other tutorials, which you should, state machines let you run little snippets of code over and over instead of one big loop. Now we've got eight cases in this program, so you know it's going to be big. In the setup, we set all our sensor and motor control pins and declare the speeds for the decoupler and the point switch motors. So we fire up a state machine, and our first case is pulling away, just sending the train round the loop. I'm using the serial print command here to display our case in the serial monitor. 
so that I always know what case the Arduino is currently running. We set the train direction and speed, and we start reading the light sensor on the track. I'm using the map function to reduce the sensor range from 0 to 1023 down to 0 to 255. That makes the sensor a little less sensitive, which does help here. Every time the sensor detects the train, it adds 1 to our counter. And when the counter is 2, so the train's done a full loop, we stop the train, pause, and then start reversing. In the reversing case, we go backwards a little slower and we start checking one of the two infrared sensors. Which one we check depends on the track counter variable. If it's odd, we check one side, and if it's even, we check the other. When the sensor reads a low value, which used to be a high value, we change the case to wagon detected. In this case, we go even slower because we're looking for the gap after the wagon. We still read the same sensor, but we do it the other way round. If it reads high when it used to read low, we've detected a gap. Change the case. Here, we lift up the uncoupler. We just pulse the motor for 150 milliseconds, and the direction depends on that track counter variable again. After that, we switch case. I've added a quick and dirty delay just to slow everything down. Then we set the locomotive speed to maximum and charge it forward for 400 milliseconds. That's just enough to break away from the decoupler. Then we add one to the track counter, so that next time we go through all the previous cases, we do the opposite siding with the opposite set of sensors and motor directions. Then we switch the points, which is code taken directly from tutorial 3, and the direction again comes from the track counter, and then we start collecting the wagons. And this is where the ultrasonic sensors come in. The Arduino doesn't know where the wagon is after the decoupling. It might not have moved, or it might have rolled backwards a bit. So when we reverse the locomotive, we reverse it all the way to the buffers at the end of the siding, where the ultrasonic sensor is. That way, we're guaranteed to pick up the wagon without hitting the buffers. Again, our choice of sensor, and therefore case, depends on the track counter. As soon as the sensor detects the train, we go all the way back to the top of the code and start going round the track again. Here's all that in action. We've got the Arduino and two motor controllers with two channels each to power the track, the points and the decoupler. And we've got two ultrasonic sensors on the sidings and one light sensor on the track, plus the two on the decoupler. Let's see that in action.
So there you go. The Arduino finally provides a solution to a problem LEGO trains have had for 50 years. Thanks for watching.